do thank you everybody for attending, members of the public, uh, the committee, officers, um, and guests this evening. Um, and just quickly, before we actually run through the agenda, um, just to give everybody an idea of, of what the plan is for this evening. Um, lots of the committee have already raised lots of questions which we've put um, to the relevant people um, in advance so that we could ensure that they had the opportunity to answer all the questions we've had fully um, and could gather all the information that was needed to do so. Um, I believe everybody else has received a copy of those and probably had a chance to have a look through those questions. Um, those will be asked and will be addressed and answered in public. Um, there will probably be further questioning from the committee um, as we go on through this evening and uh, the answers will be obviously noted by the committee. Um, we are planning on the questioning side of things this evening to not really go beyond two hours. So we would look to finish that around about nine o'clock. That's not set in stone, and if we go beyond that, then that's acceptable. Yeah. If, we, if it falls before that, then that's fine. After the questioning period, um, we will be taking a break where the committee um, will go off and refresh themselves very quickly, only for five minutes. Um, and the view is to return back to the chamber to either make a decision on whether or not we've had a, enough information to put a recommendation forward to council, or whether or not we agree that <coughs> we would rather do that on another evening and ask some more questions, find out some more information, or for the review committee to have a further meeting to discuss um, <coughs> the answers that have been given tonight. Cool. Sorry, would you mind just taking a seat there? Back. Is that right? Sorry about that. Um, moving on to the agenda for this evening. Apologies for absence. I believe there are none. Um, substitute members. I believe there are none. Non-members attending. There are quite a few. So if I could ask you just to raise your hand, roll and run through. If it would be. If you would. Yeah, we can note those now. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Is that okay? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, receive declarations of interest. Yes. There are none. Just bear with us for a moment whilst we sort the microphone problems out.
Okay. Um, just to remind um, everybody in the chamber this evening, um, the petition was that the council should refuse to place homeless peers and persons in Francis Cotty Lodge and Clarence Road flats in Rayleigh. This was discussed at full council, and the council resolution was that the review committee carries out an investigation into the matter and brings recommendations back to full council. Um, firstly, we'd like to thank everybody for attending that was invited to attend, including members of uh, Radio Action Group and Sanctuary Housing. Um, we do appreciate that all of you are busy, and we appreciate you giving up your time to be here this evening to answer the questions. Um, we'll make a start on the investigation, oh actually sorry, no, before we do, there's quite a few people that have been invited, so if I can ask them to just raise their hand just so that members of the public and perhaps for the benefit of some members are aware of who is here this evening. Um, we have Louisa Moss, the Assistant Director of Community and Housing Services. Um, Rob Manning unfortunately isn't able to be with us this evening, um, he's our Section 151 officer, but Matt Petley is here in his absence. Uh, Sean Scrutton, Managing Director. Angela Law, Assistant Director of Legal Services. Councillor Arnu, a member of, probably he's not here as he know, he's absent actually. Apologies. Um, Councillor Mrs Lumley, member of Sanctuary Housing. Um, Councillor Ian Ward. Councillor Mill, uh, he's a member for Lodge Ward. Councillor Smith, another member for Lodge Ward. And Councillor Ian Ward, who is also a member of Lodge Ward. Um, Emma Keegan from Sanctuary Housing, Managing Director. Sophie Atkinson, Director of Governance and Legal Services at Sanctuary Housing. <coughs> and Simon Clark, Group Director of Housing at Sanctuary Housing. We also have um, three representatives from, um, I think the way you actually group or the residents, certainly the residents who put the petition forward. Um, Lisa Falker, Richard Lamball, and Michelle Newton. All of these people were invited to attend this evening. The vast majority, as you'll see, have managed to go up their time to be here, um, and we'll be answering some of the questions that are put forward to them this evening. Um, we'll begin by um, asking questions. So bear with me a second. Um, asking some questions for um, for the members of Francis Cotty Lodge Action Group. Um, those questions you've obviously seen them in advance, there were three, and I understand from today that you would like to answer those questions collectively. That's okay. If you wouldn't mind, your microphone should be working. If I can just um, read the questions out just for the sake of obviously the fact that the, the meeting is recorded this evening. Um, first question Were you satisfied with the overall process undertaken? And if not, could you please explain why? Did you feel that you were kept well informed and up to date on ongoing matters? And if you were not satisfied or felt you were not kept up to date, are you able to advise members of the committee what method of communication you would have preferred? Okay, we've we'll we'll got quite streamlined questions. They don't really exactly like that, but you can just Excuse me, Chair. Could you sit down the lady put a mic down? We can't hear ourselves. That's better, thank you. Yeah, sorry, we've got... Yes, they're not the same as on the paper, but... Um, that I think they've been quite extrapolated, extrapolated what you've read out, okay. but um, what we've got is, were you satisfied with the process, and if not, why not? Did yeah. you feel that you were kept informed, and what would you have preferred? So it's, it's uh, yeah, so the just, gist of them, yeah. but I just sort of wanted to clarify that we haven't got to exactly as that. Okay. If you could address those then. All right, okay. First of all, can we start by saying that the residents who are opposed to this project are as much concerned for the homeless people in our community as everybody else. We are caring residents motivated by empathy for all those in our community, and especially those who find it more difficult to have their voices heard. <coughs> to answer your first question, we were not satisfied with the process due to the lack of support for the elderly residents who are being asked to move and the lack of involvement of our councillors in the whole process. Altogether, this just posed more and more questions, which we have chosen to expand as follows. While discussions between Sanctuary and the existing elderly tenants were taking place, were they actually offered any legal representation prior to relocation? For example, would their tenancy agreements 
some of which would have been in place for many years, state that they were entitled to remain resident for their lifetime. What was the sum of the rent they were paying at Francis Cotty Lodge? And was that amount protected for any offer of alternative accommodation? Were they assisted in changing GP? Is there new accommodation on good bus routes as it was before? What has, what should council or sanctuary done to prevent them feeling isolated? It is widely acknowledged that moving elderly people in their latter years significant, significantly contributes to a decline in their health and well-being. How have you considered this aspect? Since 2007, when Sanctuary took over Francis Cotty Lodge and the Clarence Road Flats, the site has appeared more and more dilapidated. And we know that people who have applied for residency there over the last few years have been turned away so could not even have their names put on any waiting list. Has this been a long-term plan, perhaps, of sanctuaries? And was Watchford Council aware of it? And is either party aware of any future changes planned to this building, apart from the current proposal? Were any alternative sites looked at or considered for this purpose? When were Watchford Council actually informed that Sanctuary were changing the use of Francis Cotty Lodge? We would like an explanation of how Rochford Council has relinquished all ownership of Francis Cotty Lodge and the Clarence Road Flats. We understand the reasons why the building is managed by a housing association, but cannot understand why this is not in the form of a proper management contract secured by a tender. Who or what is Sanctuary? We understand that there are two faces to this company. One is called Sanctuary Housing Association, the other is Sanctuary Homes. This company appears to be all about profits and not people. Right, I'm going on to question two now, which was, did you feel that you were kept informed? Rayleigh residents were not informed of the plans until the process was already well underway and only a few people in the immediate locality received any information. Sanctuary Housing had no intention of releasing full details of their plans at all. Once it became known by a few people, Sanctuary subsequently panicked and distributed a leaflet to 64 households in the immediate vicinity of Francis Cotty. Then once this information became known, it was very clear that the anticipated change of use would affect Rayleigh as a whole, and then naturally residents from, from a much wider area were concerned. Many residents, not just in Lodgewood, contacted their local councillors expressing their alarm. This resulted in Rochford Housing Stroke Sanctuary Group arranging two drop-in sessions at the Methodist Church. These sessions were very well attended by the people of Rayleigh, most of whom were very angry. These sessions were chaotic and misleading and only served to inflame the situation. Several residents met and informally created the Francis Ac Cotty Action Group to try and gather some accurate information. We have repeatedly asked for a formal meeting open to the public with our councillors and sanctuary housing. We wanted this to be in the form of a panel with questions from the floor. This was refused. A further leaflet was produced called You Asked, We Said. This did not paint a true picture, hence our petition. Throughout this process, there has been no one that we felt we could ask about the proposals who would give honest and true answers. One of our ward councillors sits on the board of Sanctuary, and while he was quick to offer assurances, once the news became public with regard to the proposals, it was discovered that he was not in any position to do so, and the information he had given us was unsubstantiated and only added to the confusion. When some local residents offered to attend the Friends of Francis Cotty Lodge meetings, despite going to the first one and interacting quite amicably with other attendees, those residents who had attended but also had signed the petition were then apparently banned from attending future Friends of Francis Cotty meetings. Who are Sanctuary to do this? We are as concerned for the homeless as anyone else. We may have different ideas on how the problem can be addressed, giving regard to the welfare of all concerned, but we should have been included in future meetings. We have asked to see other successful projects that Sanctuary run to address the homeless issue, but of course, no evidence can be provided by them. There has been too much supposition and not enough clarity. 
we would now like to ask that the proposed nomination agreement for Francis Cotty Lodge is presented to full council prior to any final decision being reached. Right, now going on to question three, what would you have preferred? Sorry, question three. We would have preferred that all of the current investigations have been debated prior to any decision being taken regarding any change of use of the property. We would have expected our, our elected councillors to consult with their constituents regarding the impact of such a change. We would expect them to have regard for all their constituents that after all have elected them. Following the drop-in sessions, we reasonably expected our request for a formal meeting to be granted. We would prefer Francis Cotty Lodge to remain a sheltered accommodation for the elderly, but failing this, we would prefer the entire site to be refurbished to a standard acceptable for permanent occupation. Emergency temporary accommodation should be provided by allocating two or three units within sanctuary housing or another housing association with properties around the area. Excuse me. Sanctuary proudly state that they look after 2,000 homes in the Rochford district. Why have such a high concentration of mostly vulnerable people on one site? The current proposals for Francis Cotty Lodge will produce a massively overcrowded facility which will not adequately serve the needs of the homeless which it intends to help, but will probably make more money for Sanctuary. Today, most residential areas have a mixture of owned and rented properties, and there is no reason for anyone to be aware of another person's circumstances. The proposal for Francis Cotty Lodge is becoming widely and generally known as the homeless hostel. This is a stigma for the unfortunate temporary residents, and of course must be seen as detrimental to the area as a whole. Should this proposal be allowed to go ahead, we would like an assurance that CCTV will be provided and that Rochford Council will fund a full-time warden, not just during the day, but night time as well. We would also expect our ward councillors to insist that the nomination agreement states that the property is for the use of existing Rayleigh residents, requiring temporary accommodation and not people from the wider area or indeed other areas. That was the purpose of the building. We want an assurance that the Clarence Road flats will not be made available for temporary accommodation now or in the future. Lastly, do Rochford Council have a plan or policy to the provision for over 55s and how does this change affect that plan? If there is no plan with an ageing population, then why not? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Those um, same questions were um, scheduled to be asked to the Lodge Ward councillors. Um, I understand that you were aware of that. Is that right? Yes. Yep. Um, are you, would you like to address them separately or collectively? Can you discuss that? Or? I will start. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, first question, were you satisfied with the process and if not, why not? Um, initially, I, I found that uh, again, when this occurred, I was a little bit surprised and I needed to find out all the information in regards to, to why this change. And the more I understood the change, I felt it was important that myself as a ward councillor, I was able to put, as a member of the board at the time, my views, very strong views, in regards to what residents considered were important to them directly. The first concern, and these were my concerns because I had dealt with Francis Cotty Lodge from 2014-2015 uh, in regards to some of the people who were there. They were concerned about the fabric of the building, they were concerned about certain items in regards to water supply, there were holes in a couple of the roofs, and all these things I have mentioned to Sanctuary, this is prior to me even joining 
the boat. After I learned that this was going to be a change of process, I wanted to ensure that the residents there were going to be treated with consideration in regards to any transfers and anything that, were going to, that was going to happen to them. But I was also, it was very important as far as I was concerned to ensure that in regards to those people who were going to go in to Francis Cotty Lodge as temporary homeless were from our area, were from Rayleigh, from the Rochford district. And this was a very important factor that we needed to be able to look after our own residents who were in trouble and I felt that some of the literature that was bounded around to residents was very misleading. It was giving a wrong impression. Um, and I felt quite upset about this because it was derogatory to, to homeless people. I, I've, heard, I've heard from the action group that they have consideration for the homeless, but initially there were things that were coming out that were rather derogatory towards them. And I felt that that was unfair in as much as that some of those homeless people are folk who have maybe houses burnt down, been flooded, family issues. They're local folk, your neighbours maybe, who have hit trouble within their time and they've got to have temporary accommodation. So with the whole process that went through, it seemed reasonable to me that uh, this was the right way to go. Did I feel that I was kept informed? Yes, I felt I was kept informed in regards <coughs> to how things were going on. I felt though that unfortunately that maybe a lot of residents were not informed and I did mention to Sanctuary that they should have put something out, that because of that things should have gone out to residents and I believe that they did respond to that by putting out a leaflet locally to residents, bearing in mind that this is a sanctuary property, this is not a council property and in reality it was down to sanctuary to actually manage any of the public relations that were required, in my opinion, and I believe that is correct. What would I have preferred for myself? Yes, in hindsight, I would have preferred that more information would have gone out there earlier and quicker. I would have preferred that, um, again, that better information to counter the misleading information that was out there because a lot of things have been misrepresented by the action group in a way that has distorted people's opinions, which is unfortunate, it happens, and there is a political agenda behind that action group. Again, uh, unfortunately, that's, that's the main thrust of what has happened. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Smith or Bill? Thank you. Um, I'm sure most people are aware there are three members for, for Lodge Ward. We don't all need to do the same task and in, in my particular role as portfolio holder for finance that is where I um, focus most, most of my interest having uh, Councillor Ward as uh, a longer term member of Lodge Ward and, and uh, being a member of the Sanctuary Board um, and Councillor Milne with a, a particular skill for forensic examination of matters. So um, as far as the, the process was with regard to finance was concerned, yes I, I, I have been happy with that and I know that there are some questions further on where you'll, you'll further, further look at that and there'll be further detail forthcoming. In terms of being um, in, informed, um, Obviously, as Council Ward has said, 
it is a sanctuary property. It's owned and managed by sanctuary. It, it, it's in terms of the interaction between sanctuary and RDC. Then um, yes, I, I was I was adequately informed, particularly from the finance um, side of things, going through to um, budget planning and making appropriate financial provision. Um, swiftly moving on to to if I'd have preferred anything else to have happened. Well, I'm, I'm a Rochford district councillor representing Lodge Ward, but as a Rochford district councillor, then I do have to take in, into account the whole district. And yes, I would have preferred that there was no homeless people. I would prefer that everyone was healthy and wealthy, but we're not in that sort of environment. And we do have um, issues that need to be dealt with, and it is important that we deal with them within Rochford District. I think I, I would have preferred that there wasn't the politically motivated aspect to the campaign, and certainly in the early days, the huge amount of misrepresentation about what might happen or not um, on that on that particular location. And I think I'd like to just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just right, um, you hear me all right? Right, uh, from my point of view, um, as a new councillor, uh, some of this change predated even before I was elected, and I actually thought at the time of my election, I knew through going into Francis Cotty Lodge it was going to be refurbished and people were going to have to move out. And I thought, well, that's nice, they're going to refurbish it and then move back in. Uh, later on, through rumours from the Ward, I found out that, that, in fact, there was going to be a change of use. So I started to have a look at this change of use. And with Ian, we complained to Sanctuary that they really hadn't made the, the residents near Francis Cotty aware of the change. But then, in further research and reading a lot of papers about homelessness and policy, I then found out most housing associations do not broadcast from the rooftops that they are going to change use for homeless temporary accommodation because it starts a not in my backyard campaign. I know where it is. So then we start to look at the relationship between us and Sanctuary. And I've been to one meeting with the Action Group and Sanctuary. And we also looked at the rumours going around um, that the residents in there were being evicted. It almost sounded as if they were pushed out in the road of a pram or a bag. And that really isn't what's happening. Um, what we found out is that they've been getting Rolls Royce treatment from the sanctuary. And, we've, and I can't show you the thank you card and all that for the bungalow that these people are going into or whatever. But we've had thanks from some of these people who couldn't really wait to get out of there. So what's the building for? Well, I've asked this question. Apparently there are empty units. Sanctuary, who provide housing, had empty units in that building and did not have, as I was told, a queue of over 55s waiting to get in there. Now the consequences in the situation of rising homeless is their building, their use of it. All the council can do is say, we've got somebody who says they're homeless, we've proved that they're homeless, what have you got for them? And normally, they would either equip them with a, a flat somewhere, or in this particular case, start to use this block. But the rumors that circulated were really quite evil in the area. And if anyone says the action group didn't spread any, they put some of them in emails to me, and I've printed them off. They haven't shown to anybody who wants to see them. And even the first family in there, I was told, oh, there's a smell of drugs coming out of the place, and young men in expensive German cars are calling around. What a load of tripe. Sorry. And when, when Ian me. said, I've been finished in two seconds, when Ian replied and said, yeah, we can call fine. the police about this, is serious it's allegation, fine. without all of this stuff going on. The, the important thing is this, we don't own the building. We, we basically only have nomination rights. And if we give up those, there's nothing to stop saying tree taking nomination rights from elsewhere. Okay, can, sorry, can I just refer you back to the questions that are there? Yep. Were you satisfied with the process? At the onset, no. Okay. Later on, I felt that we were informed by sanctuary with the Council of okay. So you, you felt you were kept informed? Yep. Yeah. And would you have preferred any other actions to have been taken than the action that has I been think taken? In hindsight, I should think if this was going to go on this year, it would not be handled this way. So something has been handled. 
what's come out of that. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, would you mind just switching the microphone for a moment? Thank you. Are we allowed to respond to No, I'm, I'm afraid not, no. Sorry, can I ask you that you have been invited here this evening as guests. We appreciate you attending. You've, you've managed to speak and, and had to say we've all listened to your comments. If you could just listen to everybody else's comments. I know you, I know you may not agree with them personally, but we're all here this evening to, to hear each other's views in order for this committee to make a decision, OK? Thank you. Um, we have some questions now for um, Sanctuary and for um, officers and uh, across the District Council. Chair, yes. you haven't looked up. I'd like to ask a supplementary. I understand from the overview and scrutiny officer you're accepting supplementary questions. Yes, that's right. Sorry, I have been looking and no members had indicated. I've had my hand up for five minutes. Until then, so. May I? Yes, you might. Mm -hmm. I don't need a microphone, but you won't get this on the tape. Um, these first three questions are very interesting. As a committee member, as a member of the council, I don't know what the timeline is. I don't know when this started, and I don't know when it's going to end. If it's a project, it must have started somewhere, presumably in the Rochford Housing Board. It must have progressed through a process, and it must have, it must have an end date. I haven't heard any of that from, in response to any of those questions. We're talking about, were you satisfied with the process? I don't know what the process is. Do you feel you're getting involved? I don't know what the timeline is. What would you have preferred? I don't know. I haven't seen the timeline. Has anyone got a timeline? Or at least can explain it to me. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I understand there is a latest question. Um, to Sanctuary about when this process began. Um, so that will be that question will be addressed later on this evening. Will, will it be addressed in the same manner, Chair? Or do I have to repeat the, it? The question's been asked. If you want to repeat it, you want a timeline. Obviously, as members were aware, we were all invited to put our questions forward in advance of this meeting, which you had the opportunity to do so. Uh, are you telling me off? I'm not telling you off. Are, are you admonishing me for asking a question? You will get stopped me in previous meetings asking questions, and I feel very dis ill disposed to what you just said. Councillor Mr. Mason, if you have a question, I ask the question. Somebody to address I ask the question, and I expect you to repeat, direct that question at the appropriate time. If you're not going to take it now, thank you. As I've said, there is a further question later on this evening with regards to when did the process commence. So that would answer one of the questions you had mentioned this evening, and that question I believe is been is being directed to uh, sorry, the second two sanctuary housing. Councillor Mrs. Mason. Yes, I'll speak quite loudly as well. Um, I'm not quite sure what you're saying. I know we have questions because you asked us to put them to you, but the indica the impression you're giving at the moment is we have to wait for you to go through this list of questions that you know in, in your time, and we as a committee members are not allowed to ask supplementary or other questions. If we can't question, then why are we here? That's not the case at all. As I'm I have said, as I have said at the beginning of this meeting, there are set questions which have been put forward to all those that need to answer them in advance of this meeting. I have said at the beginning of this meeting that there will naturally be subsequent questions that members could ask. Councillor Mr. Mason has asked some questions. And I am simply saying that one of those questions, which is regards to when this process commenced, is going to be asked later this evening. Is that okay that it will be addressed later on this evening, or would you like to ask it, ask it now? And if you would like to ask it now, then I will do so. Chair, sure, I'm, I'm quite happy for the question to be asked. But I asked about not when it commenced, but I asked the timeline, which goes through to completion. So it's, it's, it's an extended question. If you're prepared to let that extended question appear later, I'm happy to. Would you mind, members of the Sanctuary Council, addressing that question now from Councillor Mr. Mason, or just addressing that issue with regards to dates and timelines? Are you able to do that? Thank you very much. Oh, 
Lovely. Thank you very much. That question will be addressed now. Okay, good evening. So, uh, I'm Emma Keegan. Um, at the time that the consultation started on uh, this process last year, I was Managing Director of Rochford um, Housing Association. I'm still Sanctuary's um, Senior Representative in the area. Um, on the um, 8th of June last year, um, the Board of Rochford Housing Association um, approved that we would um, close Francis Country Lodge and we would convert it into temporary accommodation. So, that's when the Board approval um, was made. Following that, we met with residents at Francis Cotty Lodge um, and Clarence Road on the 8th of August. Prior to that meeting on the 8th of August with residents, which is the first time we advised them of our plans, I wrote to the Town Council, the three um, board members, council members, um, to make them aware and also the local MP. So that, that's the start of the process. Thank you. Does that answer your question in whole or part at the moment? Yeah, only in part because doesn't explain when it's going to, how the process is going to proceed to an end, and when that end date is, because I don't know when that is. Are you able to address that at all at the moment? Okay, in terms of um, the, uh, the, the process that we've been through in relocating the residents from Fox to Lodge, we have um, two households still within Clarkson Property Lodge, um, one of whom is moving on Saturday, and the other one will be moving um, imminently. We're just uh, introducing some works to the property that they're moving into. So within the next uh, few weeks, Clarkson Property Lodge will be empty. We anticipate starting works on the building in June, and um, there'll be a phased handover of works. We're looking at uh, doing phased works. Um, the initial residents, homeless residents, we're looking at moving in um, at, towards the end of the summer, and work should be completed on site um, around the October November time. Thank you very much. I trust that answers your question. It does completely, Jim. Thank you very much. Okay, so moving on to the questions that we have in front of us, um, which are directed to sanctuary housing. We may need to switch your microphone uh, back on. If, if I could start with question number one, which is, can you please clarify? Uh, so. The language might be slightly different, but the questions are the same. Can you please clarify how many residents there were at Francis Cotty Lodge and Clarence? Sorry, separate each separate numbers. Okay, well, first of all, good evening, everyone. I'm having a problem turning my microphone on, Chen, so. Uh, it's all, it's all, it's all, it's <coughs> okay, well thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting us along, Jen. I'll thank you for the introduction to the Claire, and as uh, Managing Director here in Rochford, I'm Group Director uh, for Sanctuary. I think some of you may remember me, I sort of started my time with you all here back in 2007 when we had this stop transfer, of course. Um, we have Sophie Andrews, our Director of uh, Governance and Legal Services. Um, so, and thank you for the clarification, by the way, on what perfect this meeting was about, because I think from our perspective, it was just a little bit confusing leading up into this, but. Uh, you know, we're absolutely here. I want to give everyone the assurances from us that we're here to support the investigation as fully as possible. Um, so there's a number of questions here being asked, uh, and we'll probably pick up uh, the larger share of them, and I'll interject as well. But so perhaps I'll pass over to Emma. Thank you. So that answers the question. Um, um, as I mentioned before, we met with residents at Parsons Crossing Lodge on Clarence Road on the 8th of August last year. At that point in time, we had one um, void property, one empty property at Parsons Crossing Lodge. So we had 10 house, households at Parsons Crossing Lodge. And um, we had one empty property at Clarence Road. So we had 13 households there. Thank you. Um, what was the average occupancy numbers, and how long did residents usually occupy a flat in the complex? Looking at the residents who um, were in occupation again at, at the 8th of August last year, at that point, um, on average, Francis Crossy Lodge tenants had lived at the scheme for three and a half years, and Clarence Road residents for six and a half years. Um, as I've already mentioned, in terms of occupancy, when we consulted with residents last year, there was one empty property at Clarence Road and one at Francis Crossy Lodge. I'm sure that we all appreciate that occupancy rates will vary, um, particularly at our sheltered schemes and it will be impacted by a number of factors such as people's health, the need to move on to um, maybe a residential care home, something like that. 
Um, I think one thing I'd just like to, uh, to make members aware um, is that there were a number of residents who had already applied for transfer to move away from Fox's Castle Lodge um, and Clarence Road at, um, as of last August. So three residents um, at Fox's Castle Lodge out of the ten had already applied for transfer and um, there were four at Clarence Road out of the 13. Thank you. Is your question, Councillor Sandy, with regards to that? There was a, a, a question there. Is it directly in regards to that question, or would you rather wait until this? No, no, no. Was the units that were not used, were they usable? In other words, were they were they in good, would they good repair to use, yeah. other than being just not being used? Were they available to them? Yeah, they, they, they were available to them. Yeah, I know that was available to them, but was they good prepared to Yes. Thank you. Councillor Mrs. Mason. Thank you. Can I just come back on that? You said that two of the units were empty. Were any efforts made by Sanctuary to offer those uh, units to people on presuming have a waiting list? And you've given figures of 7 out of 23 or 3 out of 10. Uh, on a transfer list. Is that a normal ratio or is it a higher ratio or a lower ratio than you would expect? Because we do know that lots of residents in housing situations apply for transfers, but I have no knowledge of what the mean level is, if you like. So could you say, by giving those figures, it gives no indication of whether they wanted to move, it was a normal move, or if it was because of a higher level of dissatisfaction? or that was just a normal people wanting to work within the area. Have you got okay. that information? Um, so I've got the first question was now. So it was about the, the two that you said. Oh, yes, yeah, so, um, well, clearly, since the, the, the decision was made on the 8th of, of June to, um, to to change the use of the site, to close it and change the use, we, we weren't making any attempts so, to make fill those units. Yes, um, in terms of, um, was it a higher ratio um, in terms of uh, a proportion of people on waiting list? Um, I mean, I can only talk, I don't have those figures to hand. My gut feeling is that that's high, that's a high ratio. Um, what I can say from my experience is that there were people who wanted to move to um, schemes from, which were more central to town areas. One of the difficulties we've had um, in recent years with letting the properties at Clarence Road and Francis to Lodge um, is that it, it's quite remote from the town centre and uh, by far our most popular scheme is Britain Court, which I'm sure you know is located in the centre of town. So uh, a number of those people want to see more central location. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Mr. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, question number three, we've kind of touched on already. Um, which is what was the situation with voids over the last couple of years? And I think that question really was um, how long, on average, were they into for? If, if you could just that. Okay, so um, I was asked to look at the, the um, last couple of years. So I looked at the last uh, two full financial years, so from April 2014 to March 2016, so prior to us making um, an accident decision to change the years. Um, within that two year period, six of the 11 flats. Um, became empty at Francis Cotty Lodge, one of them became empty twice. The average number of days the property was empty at Francis Cotty Lodge was 116 days. Um, but from those figures, they are distorted by the fact that we had one two bedroom accommodation, um, which was empty for almost two years because the council were unable <coughs> to nominate anybody into it. Um, that same period, four of 14 flats that came out empty at Hunt Road, and that was for an average of 20 day, two to two days each. Again, I think what that does reflect is <coughs> the difficulty we've had historically getting some of those units. <coughs> so in, oh sorry. <laughs> So in 2011, actually we had one property um, empty in 2012 for 14 months. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to question number four. Um, can you confirm how many residents were on the waiting list? Sorry, we've, we've heard a lot about the waiting list. Thank you, Louisa. Okay. Um, I'm Louise Moss, Assistant Director for our Community and Housing and responsible for the Housing Options Service, so <coughs> clearly I'll be able to answer this question a bit more clearly. Um, <coughs> how many residents on the waiting list for the site? 
Um, difficult to answer because we don't offer specific choices around site. People normally register their interest regarding where they prefer to uh, move to. So um, last year, um, 14 residents were nominated, which means they, their preferred choice was going to go into sites in Rainey, and none chose to go to Francis Scotty Lodge. <coughs> I can tell you at the moment, there's 41 applicants on our waiting list to apply for sheltered accommodation in Rainey. And you know, backing up what Sanctuary Housing has just said, for the majority on other sites, none are showing a preference for Francis Scotty Lodge, all are showing a preference for other sites that are actually locations closer to the town centre. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> uh, no questions, so move on to number five, which is, um, could you, if you can, tell us how much money was being spent annually um, by Sanctuary on general maintenance of the building? Mm -hmm. I think what I can give is, is a bit of a background to the investment that we've made at Parsons Cross Lodge and Clarence Road. So um, following the stock transfer that took place 10 years ago, we made a, a commitment to invest in all our tenants' uh, properties to bring them up to something that we termed the watchful standard, which was above the government's decent home standard. So um, the residents of Clarence Road um, and at Francis Cotty Lodge would have benefited from that work within the first five years following the stock transfer. So uh, I would estimate probably each flat we uh, spent at least five to six thousand pounds upgrading kitchens and bathrooms. Um, also, we would have done investment um, you know, throughout the, uh, the building, things like safety systems, um, fire systems, um, boilers, and those sorts of things. I mean, in terms of the annual expenditure, probably in the region of about 20,000, but there was obviously a lot of capital investment um, on top of that as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Mr. Mason. I just like to see some clarification. I, I heard what um, the speaker said about being above the government's requirements. So you've got to feel for what percentage above the government requirements was the expenditure. In other words, over and above what the government wanted, was it 50% above, 25%, 10%? Just a feel. Okay, uh, it wasn't in terms of monetary terms. I was talking about we we um, we offered made some offers to do improvements to people work, people's um, homes that wasn't included in the decent home standard. So um, to give an example, in our general leave schemes, we we offered to give people over over bath showers, and that's not something that's in the government standard. In our sheltered accommodation, we offered all residents a level access shower. Again, that's that's not in the decent home standard. So that's something that we offered over and above. So. Um, I don't have a monetary figure, it was, I was purely referring to the fact that we offered some things that aren't strictly part of the, uh, the government's decent home standard. Exactly. Yes, is there any other information? Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on to question number six. What staffing arrangements were in place at the sites before the start of the changes? Okay, well, the, um, for, for those of you who may be familiar with, with sheltered schemes, you'll know that over a number of years there's, there's been a change in the way that schemes are, are managed and, um, you know, as a, as a nationwide um, change. In 2003, something called supporting people funding came in and uh, that money was paid for housing-related support um, in sheltered schemes. Um, so we did historically, there would have been a, a full-time scheme manager on site, but in 2011, Essex County Council reduced our funding by um, 44% um, and they changed the contract with us about the support we needed to provide to our sheltered tenants so that we needed to provide half an hour of support to each household per week. So um, following those reductions, so in 2011 we moved to um, an arrangement where it's a part-time scheme manager who would have worked on site Monday um, to Friday and um, delivering that support service and also making sure that the uh, you know, communal uh, parts of the building were maintained. Is that okay, members? No questions? <coughs> okay, moving on to number seven. Um, could you briefly outline what agreement was in place for the residents? For example, were there annual reviews of their tenancies? Okay, so tenancies were less on the short or short tenancies. I suppose what we would uh, commonly think of them as um, is lifetime tenancies. So they weren't let on um, short short hold, they weren't let on fixed term tenancies, they were um, let on on an assured tenancy. Um, and a short tenancy fairly be brought to an end under um, you know, the terms of the tenancy agreement. Thank you. Any questions from members? 
Councillor Mr. Hoyt. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Just two questions. One on raising because it was mentioned in here, although it might be more pertinent to the next set of questions. Um, it was mentioned that the Sanctuary Board made the original decision. What's that? Is this the actual Sanctuary Board or the Rochford Committee, as it's now called? Um, and were the Rochford Committee involved in the decision at all? And the second question is around placing people who are already homeless within your sheltered schemes. I'm aware of at least one person who's been placed in a shelter scheme who didn't meet the age requirements. I wonder if, if that had happened at either of these properties already. Thank you. And the ASO, the clarity of the decision I referred to on the 8th of June last year was a Rochford Housing Association board decision. Um, just for clarity, uh, we went through um, a transfer of engagements in sanctuary housing um, last November, so that's when the board of Rochford Housing disbanded and the sanctuary Rochford committee met for the first time this January. So it was a decision that was made last year from the past of Rochford Housing. Um, in terms of placing um, homeless people within our sheltered schemes, yes, we do we do that on occasion. We have done that on a number of sites, and um, that we are using the uh, we, what we use is ex um, former scheme manager properties um, because we moved away from <coughs> employing residential scheme managers, as did you know the majority of the social landlords a number of years ago. And um, so we have these um, scheme, former scheme manager properties, um, like the one at Parks Potty Lodge, which is independent, it's not accessed through the scheme, it, it's, a, 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 it's a, an independent property, and we use that for temporary accommodation. But so we have to use other sites as well. Thank you. Does that address your question? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Um, we now have some questions which relate to the process that was used to move the residents. Um, can you just confirm how much notice was given to residents and was it based on, was that notice period based on a previous experience? Okay, thank you. Speaking. Um, in terms of a notice period, what we advise people, um, you know, when you're talking about people's lives and you're talking about moving home, you know, we, we, we did not go in and say, well, I think we've got to move in out within, about, uh, within six months. So we met with residents on the 8th of August 2016. The important thing was to find um, residents accommodation that was suitable for them. Um, we've since done that, and as I said before, we've, we've only got a couple of residents left to move. Um, we had a script to follow at the drop-in sessions. We made that sure that everyone had um, consistent um, information. Um, and what we said to them um, afterwards, and we gave them this and um, frequently asked questions, and in there was a question, what are your time scales? And what we said in there was, our aim is to provide all the necessary assistance to help you find suitable returns of home. And as this may take some time, it is difficult to say when the scheme will close. We will meet with you to discuss your preferences and then endeavour to assist you either through rehousing you in the Rochford Housing Association property or when necessary working with council and other landlords. Once we've met with you all individually, we'll have a better idea of time scale, but it's likely to be spring or summer 2017. Okay, thank you very much. No questions, so we'll move on. Um, how was the figure of the financial assessment reached? We understand that residents that have moved out have received a financial figure. Can you just confirm for members how that figure was reached? Yes, that's correct. Yes, that's correct. Where, where a tenant has to leave their home, they're entitled to statutory compensation, which is known as home loss. The amount of this payment is set in law, and it's currently £5,800. We went above and beyond this, though, by also arranging the pay for all removal costs for the tenants moving from Francis Cotty Lodge. We also agreed to reimburse tenants for any additional charges incurred as a result of them moving, so that might have been something like moving their satellite service or a telephone line. We arranged and paid for new carpets in the properties that they moved to, or new flooring. We decorated them in accordance with people's choices. We gave them colour choice and decorated the properties that they were prior to them moving in. Um, if somebody moved to a property and needed new blinds, new curtains, those sorts of things, we also reimbursed them for that cost. We also said that if the tenant had substantially improved their existing property, would bought um, an item um, you know, just prior to this amount of the decision to close, We'd look at that on a one-to-one -one basis and compensate them for that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, Councillor Mr. Boyd, did you just need to ask a question? Okay. Thank you. 
um, question said, what was the financial settlement meant to be used for? Is that just for compensation? Or is that to cover moving expenses? I think you've kind of answered that already. Right? So, so how much is statutory and the, the rest is for um, were there any additional or external supports to help residents move and cope with changes? Okay, so as mentioned before, we had this week we asked questions that we issued um, to, to residents to start with their with them, and um, we um, offered significant support to them, and we put that in the week when we asked questions. So we said that we'd support them to find new accommodation, which was not just taking them to go and see a bar accommodation, but it would include liaising with other social landlords both inside and outside of the district where that was appropriate. Um, support with packing and moving, so if someone was unable to, to pack their own belongings, we paid for that service. Uh, support with re-registering with doctors, arranging and fitting adaptations required in the tenancy's flats, and um, things like setting up your direct debits uh, with uh, utility providers, arranging new telephone and satellite services. So we confirmed all that to, to tenants um, in writing. But we very much took a person-centred approach. Some people had family who were, were happy and willing to assist them, and some people um, you know, maybe were less confident in some aspects, and, and we directly supported them. So we tailored our support to their specific needs. Four of the eight households who've moved out to date have written and thanked us for our assistance. Thank you very much. Councillor Hillpoint. Yes, uh, my question on the back of uh, what you said is, uh, is this. Um, you obviously do refurbishments of uh, properties where tenants have to move out, and then they are offered the uh, facility to go back or stay where they've been moved to. Um, is there anything in the in what you've stated which would be different in those circumstances as to what's happened at Francis Hill? I mean, there was a question later on about the coach. I don't know if you want to combine the two of them up now. There is. Would you mind just waiting for us to go through these questions? And if it's not addressed afterwards, if you just indicate, and then we can address that question at the end. If that's all right. Okay. Councillor Mr. Mason. It's Mr. Mason. Chairman, may, may I ask? The council has um, undertaken a, a great deal of work um, appointing staff and members with safeguarding. The question I want to ask is whether Sanctuary or the council considered whether any of these um, tenants uh, who were elderly fell into the category where safeguarding should have cut in. Was there any consideration given to that? Please. Thank you. Would you be able to answer that? I mean, obviously our staff um, at Sanctuary Housing um, are trained um, in safeguarding um, and because our ski managers work with our residents on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we already had information about um, people's uh, you know, medical needs or vulnerabilities or, or had an indication as to where we thought they might need more assistance or, or more help. But as I alluded to before, um, you know, family members um, were, were involved in this process um, at the initial meeting, we um, welcomed any of their support networks at that meeting. A number of people came um, with their, their family members. Um, so I'm not sure that anything really fell into that category because um, the residents who um, you know, we had identified as vulnerable actually were being assisted by their, their families through the process. Thank you. Good reason. Yeah, I think Um, also, no safeguarding concerns were raised through the council. Obviously, um, allocation officers and other officers work very closely in this sanctuary throughout the process, so um, our knowledge and understanding of any vulnerability was the same as sanctuary. So. Thank you. Does that address your question? It answers the question, Chairman, but I, you know, board members spoke of um, social media sites and they spoke of you know, on the social media site, I, I certainly recall uh, reading that there, there were vulnerable people who, that other members of the community were concerned about. So that's why I asked the question. Um, clearly, there was no um, particular need identified by Sanctuary, nor by the council. 
that the question remains in the community. I have to leave it there. Um, question 12. Uh, was a meeting held by Sanctuary at Francis Cotty Lodge with all residents present, along with directors from Sanctuary, where the situation was fully explained and residents were able to ask questions and receive answers? If so, when was this, and who was invited, and how? If not, why not? Okay, thank you. I've touched on this already. So just to, to reiterate, we um, held sessions for residents of Parks and Trotty Lodge on the 8th of August between 12 and 3, and for residents of Clance Road on the same day between 3 and 6. Family members and carers um, of their support network were invited to accompany tenants to these sessions. And where people were unable to attend, we made arrangements to visit them at home, or we contacted them um, you know, if they were away, or we contacted them by telephone. So we made sure that everybody was um, had a, a personal one-to-one. Representatives from uh, Rochford District Council and Sanctuary attended, and I was there, so that answers the, the question about a, a director being present. Um, following that meeting, obviously, you know, we, we, could, we were telling people news that they needed to go away and di digest, so we arranged to follow up one to one meetings. Some of them took place a couple of days after this meeting, some of them took, about, took place about three weeks later because it was to accommodate people's needs. Um, but that was to go and talk to them about their individual requirements and concerns. Um, we also gave comprehensive written information and frequently asked questions that I brought to you Thank you. Councillor <coughs> uh, Mr Chairman, uh, we've just heard our wonderful sanctuary uh, was behaving out, even this, that, whatever was. Can you tell me, with these uh, vulnerable old uh, residents, was they actually given independent legal advice uh, going through this process? Would you have to answer that question? If they were given independent or offered independent? I think uh, um, independent legal advice. Did you feel any of them needed independent advice or did anybody ask for it? Well, nobody asked for it. I mean, if someone came to us and asked for any independent advice, we would uh, refer them to someone like this advice for an university and advice for it, but nobody approached us for such a time. Was the uh, the tenants uh, uh, pointed in the, in the direction to take up independent? legal advice, or was it just skipped over and not mentioned? We, we, did, we didn't ask the question. What we did say um, is on the frequently asked questions, we asked people to come back to, to us if they have any concerns. Um, I think if I go back to my earlier point of the 10 residents in the scheme, because three had already asked for transfer, so they quite frankly copied copy when we said we were going to close the scheme, because they got higher priority to, to move. Um, and I've also referred to the fact that the four residents of business were thanking for everything we did and the support that we gave and um, more about the, you know, helping them to move. So whilst we didn't specifically ask that question, we certainly said any queries, please the contact details as who you need to speak to. We included on that initial contact list uh, officers from the council as well as uh, officers from Sanctuary Council. Um, and I think sort of whilst we're on this as well, we, we didn't have any complaints from Parks City Lodge residents, we didn't have any council inquiries or any inquiries. So, you know, from that, I take that um, the residents will be content with the, uh, the service we provided. Thank you. Uh, no more questions, so we'll move on. Um, could you clarify how many options of alternative accommodation were offered to residents? Okay, so when we spoke to the residents' council plans, we explained that we'd help them find a new home. And if they didn't like the first home that we offered them, that we'd, uh, we'd offer them two further homes. Um, so some people had already registered for transfer, as I said. For those who hadn't already registered for transfer, um, we met with them, we talked to them um, about the areas um, or the type of accommodation they'd like to move to. We then spoke to them through our knowledge and the visit was jointly with the council, so they could talk about other social landlords and we could talk about the accommodation we had available. So clearly if someone was asking us for something which didn't exist, we, we had to manage their expectations. But um, we, um, we uh, made them aware of the options, we uh, arranged visits for people to go and, and view accommodation. Um, and we did, a, we did a bit of just phoning people up saying, would you consider this? So rather than it being a formal offer of accommodation, it was just a, you know, you might not know this scheme, we want to pop down and have a look around. Um, and as I said before, all tenants have either moved or uh, accepted. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, just expanding upon that, the alternative accommodation, would that have been within a particular distance from Francis Cossie Lodge? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's uh, I, uh, I think it's safe to say, uh, Louise, that the majority of people want to stay in, in Rayleigh. I have to say that some people have actually moved out of Rayleigh, but initially uh, the majority of people wanted to, to stay in Rayleigh. Um, just to say that um, I just want to give um, residents when they're um, obviously their choice is maximised by both annexation officers from Rochdale and Sanctuary attending. And um, quite a lot of the residents, uh, when offered a choice, were accepted their first choice as well. And most of those are near the location of the high street and um, stroke in Wayne. Thank you. <coughs> um, so I'm sorry? Um, yes, I don't see any problem. where 
maybe someone hasn't looked after the decoration of their property and they went into a newly decorated property. But in terms of what we did, in terms of our kitchens and bathrooms, we brought all our properties up to the optimum standard in the first five years post stock transfer. So there shouldn't be um, a, a vast difference in the standard of our properties. And when we let properties, they will reach um, a, an agreed letting standard. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Um, have Sanctuary carried out any form of satisfaction survey with residents that have moved out? If not, have you received any feedback from those residents at all that you could share with the committee? I think you've obviously touched on the fact you've received some letters. Yeah, okay, thanks. so, sorry. <laughs> sorry, yeah. So we've received um, four thank you letters. So um, we've got thank you very much for all your help. You've made Francis Cross a great place for me to live in. I'm sorry to be looking so soon, but I hope you'll come and visit me in my new home. Um, lots of gratitude. Um, there was one, um, actually, was, it was addressed to um, the council and the team. Thank you for your help and understanding of finding the accommodation we hoped for. Hope to be there soon. Um, another one, many thanks for your help you've given me. Um, another one, actually, I don't have the word in tune, but it was a thank you very much. Any questions? No, I think I've been passed from the letter today. That was related, but just not Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Hook. <coughs> um, yes, you had some letters. The question was, was a satisfaction survey. No, we didn't have a satisfaction survey. Mm -hmm. Councillor Stanley, did you have another question? Um, well, there's obviously two sides to the coin. Did you get any? response from this Now, as I stated before, we, we've had um, no complaints from residents from Francis Cottie Lodge. We've received no MP inquiries and no cancer inquiries on behalf of the tenants either. Okay, thank you. No further questions? Um, question 16. Concerning the change of use, could we please have confirmation of whether the change of use was a case of sanctuary responding to a demand stroke request from RDC, sorry, Rochford District Council, or was it sanctuary that initiated it? If the latter, could you briefly explain why this was? Um, I'll, I'll respond initially to that. Um, the quick answer would be yes, Sanctuary Housing Association were responding to the Rochford Council's housing need. Um, conversations are always ongoing with registered providers, including Sanctuary. We're very open about our housing need, and we're always looking for opportunities to see how we can meet it. So. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Mr. Mason. Yeah, Chairman, um, like C C Councillor Stanley said, there's another side to this, isn't there? This is the opposite. Having taken these two properties out of over 50 farms. I presume, and I don't recall, and I'm sure uh, Ms. Moss can, can put me right, um, there must be a plan for housing over 55s in our district. And what effect has that had, taking these two properties out of over 55s, what effect has it had on that plan? <coughs> I understand there are, are wider conversations going on about housing um, need as in um, independent living with Essex County Council. Um, and at the moment, the impact of taking this scheme out has had very little on the um, demand for um, shelter accommodation generally. Chairman, I'm going to be a nuisance and ask what very little means because, you know, I'm sorry, I'm a quantifiable sort of person. Um, the numbers on our waiting list since October have gone up by two. Okay. Thank you very much. Is that just to clarify for how many? That's quite a There are in total, for wait, on waiting for sheltered accommodation across the whole of the district, 73 residents, and it's now gone up to 75. Thank you. Yeah, that's, sorry, just to clarify, um, it's 73 in October and it's gone up to 75 as of yesterday. Thank you. <coughs> no questions? Um, question 17. In your opinion, do you think that the consultation with local residents, and um, this means not residents of Francis Cottage Lodge, 
Um, do you think that was adequate? And if not, why not? Would you better answer that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I think just, just to be clear from the outset, um, we did not need to consult local residents um, at all about our plans, um, as there was no change of use of the property it was going from um, a sheltered scheme, which is where sector scheme, um, to another residential scheme, albeit for um, temporary accommodation use. However, as a courtesy, we informed immediate householders around the scheme through a flyer with both of about our plans because we recognise that um, you know, people would want to know why construction lobbies turn up and, uh, and activities going on. Um, we, did, um, we did issue an apology um, around the October time, so we recognise that we um, did miss some of the local um, residents. So, for example, we missed the residents at New York Road who are back on Swarovski. So, we, as soon as we were aware of that, we rectified that, we wrote to them, we apologised for our own designs. Um, one of the, just an example of how the consultation we um, have with the local residents um, has influenced what we've done. At the information session that was referred to earlier on the 18th of October, um, we talked um, about some of the concerns that local health residents had about things like car parking provision, about CCTV, about lighting and security. Um, and based on the feedback we've received, we've taken that into um, account in terms of the CCT provision that we're designing in. Um, and also we increased the number of car parking spaces between the time we had that event and submitting our planning application in November. Thank you. Councillor Mrs Mason. Yes, thank you. Um, accepting that no planning application was required, I think we were all aware of that. Um, one of the major issues seems to be that poor communications and initial lack of transparency has led to misinformed information <coughs> and distress. With hindsight, do you feel that the process of communication, both with the local residents, the wider community, and members of RDC, could have been improved? And that, do you believe that would have alleviated some of the concerns that we have heard expressed tonight? I think that's straight into to question, question 18. 18. Maybe I can take them together. Which so says, would you do the same again, and if not, what? Yeah. So, um, Fundamentally, we were responding to a request by the council, um, and as a valued partner and someone who invests heavily in this area, we would always seek to work positively with the council if we were able to. So we're extremely uh, proud of playing our part to provide housing for people who um, are, need, are in need and are homeless. Um, we would manage the information the same way again, because, um, as I said before, this continues to be residential accommodation. It is residential accommodation at the moment will continue to be going forward. So we don't feel there is any material impact on, on neighbouring people. Instead, we took the view that people in the immediate area would be interested in knowing what's going on because they are their neighbour and because they would see construction traffic and so on going on. Um, but um, with the exception of, so we missed some people from the, the initial conversation, uh, consultation <coughs> and the, the information we get. And with the exception of that, we were happy with the process. I think one of the questions or one of the points that was made at the beginning by the, uh, the, um, the action group um, was about um, the confusion caused by our information session on the 18th of October. Just like you to make you aware, we gave out a seven page flyer at that event, written flyer, which has been available on our website and the council website um, ever since. So um, whilst I accept that people might have felt, you know, their opinion of that event was chaotic, we did ensure that there was a seven page um, information that people could I could go away and, and look at the news. Um, would you like to come back? Yeah, I'd like to come back. Um, I, I accept that you have communicated, and I accept that you don't have a legal responsibility to do so. I think we all know that. Having said that, there has been an action group before. There's a lot of residents here, and that is unusual. I mean, it's very unusual to have so many residents at any meeting. That would indicate to me that the communication process has been flawed. Now, I accept that the intentions were good, and I accept that there was no intention to cause distress, but it has done. And I am concerned to hear that even with hindsight, you would do the same thing again. I would like you to reconsider that as a company at perhaps a later stage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Stanley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, having, having listened to, to the arguments both, on both sides, would you consider 
talking with the residents again as to some of their concerns, which, which obviously these concerns are, are their concerns. They, they live in the area and, and I know that you are, you're going to make the place uh, a better place to live in and, and there'll be more families there than what there, well, I assume there will be, I, I believe there will be, than what there was originally. And would, would you be, would you consider uh, addressing some of their issues that they've brought here tonight, later? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've always um, said that I'm happy to meet residents. There's residents in this room today that I've never dined with their home or they've come to see it in the office. So we have held um, meetings with, with residents. The thing that we've, um, that we've said that we wouldn't do is hold um, a big public meeting because we just don't feel that's the best way for people to get their individual concerns heard. But yet more than willing to keep, keep, keep in small groups and say, certainly there's people in the room that I've met with. And that would be with Rochford District Council uh, along, alongside of you or, or separately? Yeah, well, well, one of them, uh, what, like one of the meetings was specifically because there was about security at the site, so that was obviously just relevant to sanctuary housing. Um, and um, the other meeting, the board councillors, which was referred to earlier, the board councillors were invited to attend. Um, but certainly, you know, if we, we have worked jointly with the council, if we build our own issues that are relevant to both the, the council and the sanctuary, then of course we would work jointly. But it, as, as I really say, we, we, you know, we're just not sure that public meeting is the best way to sort of people's issues. Maybe not a, a public meeting, but you, you, you will correspond with them, those that uh, have concerns. That's what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. That, I mean, that is the essence of it, isn't it? Yeah, really? the, the last contacts I had from a, a member of, of the public outside of, of um, the, the, the action group um, sent me January. But we certainly, um, I'm aware my, my, um, you know, my details are on the, the website, on the council's website, and um, we're, you know, we're open to keeping contacts in us. But we have no contact from a member of the public sent me January, apart from those connected with the action group. Thank you. Councillor Hookway, you did have a question. Would you, has it been addressed yet or not? I can't believe what it was. You were going to ask. Not, uh, not quite directly. Um, my, my question was um, that um, yeah. obviously sanctuaries involved with refurbishments of other properties where residents have had the opportunity to return to, the, to those properties. Um, um, and is there any difference in how they deal with that process? As there was a question that I stated about the furbish, but that, that was specifically about if we were, if we were going to be furbish classes, it's not. Um, in terms of, um, I, mean, I don't know if it's relevant to the meeting, Chair. I don't know if it's relevant to the meeting. Do, do you want me to talk about what we do at other schemes in terms of refurbishing and people um, I think maybe we'll carry on with the questions at the moment as they are. Um, and then we'll revisit that at the end if we need to, if that's okay. If that's okay with you. Um, okay, we've got some questions now moving on to kind of the future um, arrangements of Francis Cottage. Um, number 19 was, could you clarify what the intention is concerning staffing arrangements for the site going forward? Okay, well we've already confirmed in our bits and publications that there will be an on-site presence. Um, and that we will manage it um, appropriately um, in accordance with the needs of the site. So there will be someone on site um, Monday to Friday. Um, the question earlier was about, um, will that be full time? And it, it won't be full time because we don't feel that is necessary in order to ensure that most of us are settled. We feel that we can uh, manage that um, you know, during working hours Monday to Friday. Um, and we will deal with any issues that uh, arise appropriately. Okay, thank you. Councillor Cooper. Um, the state that there's going to be someone there in the daytime, Monday to Friday. What happens the weekends? What happens in the evening times? Are you uh, willing to put CCTV cameras there to be, just to make sure everything's okay? Yeah, there will be CCTV at the scene. And obviously, if we find that um, we need to put additional. Um, resources in that that would be something that we would um, that we would consider as we would with any of the properties that we manage. We would review them on an ongoing basis. And the CCTV uh, cameras are they 24 hour uh, 
going to be someone watching them, or is it just going to be recorded? I, I can't talk to you, I'm sorry. I apologise in detail about the CCTV specification. So, so you don't know? I, I can't talk to you about the specification, but obviously, um, you know, our advice to any residents, like any resident, anywhere in the district, if there's an issue um, outside the bounds of the Act, then it's, it's the police's statutory duty to it. So it would be about the tax. So you know, obviously, we're dealing with uh, vulnerable people, so if anything does happen between uh, darkness hours after 6 o'clock or on weekends, that their only option is to phone the police. Well, there's no, um, there's no, um, there's no indication that residents of Francis Cottage Lodge would be vulnerable just by virtue of them being homeless. So what, what is the purpose of someone being there in the daytime? Because we will be um, working with, with the council, we will be working with these residents um, to, to sustain their tenancies in the way that we have scheme managers on our shelter schemes at the moment. So we will be working with them to help them to sustain their tenancies. Um, you know, they'll, they'll be moving on from their small permanent uh, accommodation. So at the moment, we're looking at a part-time resort, Monday to Friday. As we already said, we will review our resources. We need to do more, indeed, if we need to provide less, then, then we will change that over time. But there will be a certain amount um, of work with that. Um, obviously, that local staff will need to do in terms of making sure that, that we manage compliance issues and site issues and contractors in the community. I won't ask any more questions, Mr. Chair, because I think questions are coming up in the last Thank you. Thank you. Um, what terms and conditions will apply to the old residents of Francis Scotty Lodge? Um, would it be like for like? Okay, so residents who've moved from Francis Scotty Lodge to our other properties would have moved on the same terms and conditions. So that they will have the, uh, the same type of terms and conditions. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, is the use of Francis Cossey Lodge exclusively for Rochford District Council nominations or can Sanctuary bring in tenants from outside of the district? Um, if I can just confirm, it will be for the exclusive use of um, Rochford nominations. Thank you. Any questions? How will Francis Cossey Lodge be promoted? I think it was asked. probably raised really with regards to the question before, um, which is, I think, concerns about nominations from other districts and whether or not Francis Cotter has been promoted to other authorities to use. Yeah, okay, thank you for clarity. So, Sorry. as Louise has already said, it, it's going to be uh, nominations from, from the council. Um, so, there'll be residents to be given flat in the accommodation according to the district council's policy. Thank you. Um, Councillor Mason. Just need to clarify that, Chair. Is that, is that subject to a legal agreement between the Council and, and Sanctuary? Or is this something that is just, you know, um, a convenient, yes, that's okay at the moment? It will be managed through a legal nomination agreement between Sanctuary and Washington. So that's a legal agreement? Councillor Mr. Hoy. Yeah. Can you confirm that that is? Just from the Rochester Traditional Council list, there, there are none from the Housing Association list that have been nominated. Exclusively from Rochford's, um, you know, register. Councillor Stanley. Thank you, Chairman. The um, question is um, we, obviously, we, we won't be uh, vacating two, two properties like has been done in the past, <coughs> and that we will occupy or use that building to its to its full extent in the future? Um, absolutely. I mean, there's 42 households at the moment in emergency check accommodation. This is providing us with 12 units, so you can see how much the demand is. It will be uh, a priority use for us, and you'll be always for that. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you. Um, can you explain why this makes financial sense for Rochford District Council? Because hands over. Is that okay? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, if I could just uh, emphasise what uh, Assistant Director Moss has said there, we currently have 42 households in temporary accommodation. So, to put some perspective on that, 
if we were to house one household in temporary accommodation tonight, that would cost the council £65 in a bed and breakfast accommodation. Over a week, if you do the maths, that's £455. Over a year, £23,660 to house one person or one family in one room. Obviously, that gets offset slightly with housing benefit and a, a client contribution. But if we if we multiply that up over the seven, I believe it's 17 units at Francis Cotty Lodge, it's a saving to Rochford District Council compared to putting those residents into bed and breakfast accommodation of £288,670 for a full year. Thank you. Councillor Mr Mason. Chairman, I, I know um, Ms Moss spoke a moment ago saying it will always be full. Is there any penalty if uh, there's a void within the terms of the agreement the sanctuary? Or is Rockford District Council going to be in any any loss if anything is left vacant? Um, we're currently looking at the nomination agreement. Of course, any nomination agreement will have penalties in there if there is a void for a certain period of time. Um, that's all I can say, but we don't anticipate there will be any void period for that period of time. Could I ask a further question? It's about, it's about bad debts. Um, probably not the right term. It's probably something to do with the delinquency on rent payment, I suppose. Um, uh, is there any liability on Rochester District Council for, for bad debts um, on the lettings um, <coughs> from sanctuary um, to homeless people placed in Francis Cotty Lodge and the other building by the council? In other words, where does the liability sit? <coughs> that is something we're discussing with sanctuary at the moment. Um, there were be a certain liability with Rochester Council, but we want to ensure that they, you know, we never get to that point, bearing in mind we're putting a lot of support for tenants at the time of their tenancy, and that's sustained by sanctuary going forward. Can I ask how a bad debt could arise? Um, exclusively around non payment of rent. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mr. Hoy. Um, sorry if I missed this, this is for Louisa Moss again. Um, how long is the legal agreement for? Um, sorry, um, the nomination agreement, as far as I'm aware, has no end date. Um, it's up until, you know, it's during the time that the property is used by the council. So do I come back? So does that mean there is a notice period the council has to give? I would very much like there to be no homelessness, and I would very much that happen. You know, I can't see it, obviously, in the near future, but hopefully it will happen at some point. Um, how does the agreement end? Yeah, there will be a notice period, yes, should it need to end. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no further questions, so we'll move on. Um, what possible refurbishment work Will sanctuary be doing to the existing units in France? Okay, I think I answered this earlier actually. Mm -hmm. So the properties that um, um, that the rent to there that have been vacated, they have already been put up to the sort of standards, so they're, they're ready and suitable to let. Whenever a property becomes vacant, we also carry our centre safety checks to the properties do minor repairs, so they'll just be brought up to our, our medical standards. Okay, thank you. Questions. There is an indication that some new tenants will be vulnerable. What support will they be receiving from Rochford District Council, Sanctuary, and possibly other agencies, i.e., GP services? Um, just for you know, the starting point will be that a client approaches the council. Um, obviously, we carry out initial investigations with the client. Um, that includes what support they're either already receiving or what support they might need. Um, we would then signpost accordingly. Our principal housing related support provider is commissioned by county. Um, they call Family Mosaic and we work very closely with them. Um, all the details about the tenant and any support they're receiving is subsequently then passed to um, Sanctuary through the relevant sort of formal nomination arrangements. 
Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Mr. Hall. Um, will the full time, or not so full time, I'm still quite sure about that, member of staff on site be trained to help residents? Certainly, all our, our members of staff is in training, which is hosted to their life. And I should have made that the more explicit. And will they be in a position to actually help residents if they have problems, such as if they need to claim benefits or, or housing allowances, which they may not be claiming? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, no further questions, so we'll move on to number 26. Um, could we receive clarification of the definition of temporary basis? What is likely to be the maximum duration and what will be the process for the tenant after this time? Um, I'll answer that. Um, clients with a housing priority need are placed in emergency temporary accommodation during the time that we carry out an investigation and, and decide on the actual homeless application. Um, once a decision is made, utopia is that we then move the client on to more settled accommodation. But the reality is, there's a lack of affordable uh, property out there. So there is a slight blockage. So the current delay means the anticipated time for clients that will stay in this fast cottage lodge, as per our FAQ, is talking about two to eight months. Any further questions? Mm -hmm. Any members have any questions? Okay, moving on to question number 27. Will the emergency call system in Francis Cossie Lodge still be operational for the new residents if necessary? Uh, no, we, we don't anticipate there'll be a need to do that. It's, it's the service we provide in our shelter schemes. Maybe the residents are feeling unwell, has a fall, needs to be attended in an emergency, it's not something that people think is appropriate. Okay, thank you. Councillor Stanley. In, in the uh, uh, emergency court procedure, something, uh, this has to be, it's regulatory, isn't it, for disabled to be able to call on assistance if they find they need it? Uh, well, we will have two well chair assistance plans, but the emergency call system at the moment in Francis Cotton Lodge will be taken out of the existing system, but we provide it to the plans. So, I'm just saying, are you asking if there is a legal requirement? Yes, yeah, there's like, a legal requirement. I think more disabled uh, in, in the way of it was left to. I mean, it's always, we're not, they're all, everybody's not going to be able to walk and what have you. So I just wondered if, it, if we have to, at any time, it goes to a disabled person, which you can do. Mm -hmm. Is there a court system that they could use should they be in residence there? So just answering the question about the legal requirement, as, a, as the owner of the property, we have a legal requirement to make what they call reasonable adaptations to a property. And we have to do that in line with the resident's need. So it's not a standard, you know, everyone has a full board, it just depends what their particular need was. So if we had a resident in the region that did have a disability who required a particular system to call for assistance, then we would install something like that for that particular resident, but we're not doing it kind of blanket call for assistance. Okay, that answers your question, Councillor Stanley. Thank you. Um, will there be a review of parking spaces after the facility is in use? Well, we will obviously uh, review the situation and, and monitor the situation. So if we find there's a, a problem with parking, then we will have access. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Um, an assumption has been made that Sanctuary will receive a higher financial return from Francis Cotty Lodge being used to temporarily house homeless people. Is this correct? And if so, are you able to provide any more detail? And so now we won't um, receive a higher financial return in so much as um, events are set, are set in line with government guidance and service charges um, reflect actual costs. And, uh, and obviously we are a not-for-profit organisation, so events we set in line with government guidance, service charges reflect actual costs. Okay, thank you. 
questions. Um, we've got some general questions now. Um, number starting number 30. Was Francis Cotty Lodge due a major refurbishment anyway, and tenants would have been moved elsewhere during the refurbishment? Would they have been eligible to return as an option, and would a payment of £5,000 be made to each tenant? Um, so, as, as I've already said, so all the individual flats have already been refurbished and, and they've had new kitchens and um, bathrooms, and there were no further plans to refurbish Francis Cotty um, Lodge. Um, taking into account the number of factors included, demand and location, we decided um, that it had um, no long term future as, as a sheltered scheme. Um, so, um, in terms of, we never intended to, to carry out any further refurbishment work, so we've been able to return because that wasn't our plan. Um, and that payment of £5,000, I'm not sure where that comes from. As I said, the statutory payment mm -hmm. is actually where people, once someone loses their home and moves out, uh, refurbishing property doesn't necessarily qualify you for home loss. Um, it'll be uh, remodelling. So for instance, if we had, um, you know, we'd be removing walls and moving properties around and that sort of thing, they would qualify for, for home loss if they can physically move back into the flat that they've come out of. But we don't pay them when they move back in to be clear to home loss pay to compensate people that they move out. Okay, thank you. I think this is the question that
they moved to Rayleigh, but they belonged to a club in Holbridge. He ferried them taxis to. Did did that happen at part of Cottage Lodge? Do you know? Is that the subsidising? Well, um, yeah. I said Tidos is quite a different um, situation. Yeah, I know. The refurbishing of people were moving back. So you're absolutely right. When we talked before about trying to. Um, Compensate people and make sure that they don't have out of pocket expenses. It's in their house if someone moved to Bailey, but they wanted to continue to go to the social club in Hockley, then yes, we would have paid their, um, you know, their taxi or, or their um, travel to go back. So, um, but they could continue with those links. I think there was a comment made earlier about, you know, do we realise the impact that, um, that moving people at this age has? Well, yes, we absolutely do. And that's an example of something we did. Now, this, is, this situation is slightly different because people aren't going to be moving, moving back. And so the compensation really is about um, and the financial um, you know, covering their expenses is really about removing the process. Um, so I'm not aware of anything we've committed to long term. Okay, thank you. No further questions, so we'll move on to number 31. Um, how often does Sanctuary refurbish their buildings in their sheltered housing schemes? Is there a plan in place for Francis Cotty Lodge regarding future refurbishment work that you could share with us? And we would assess our assets on a, a scheme by scheme basis. So um, there are the, um, there's no further plans for us to put lodge other than what we have at the moment. Um, and I've already explained that how we approach the introduction and the investment in our schemes in the first five years of the council. Any questions? Uh, number 32. Uh, did you feel that there was a conflict? Of, oh, sorry, big problem. Um, this is for. Uh, members of the Sanctuary Housing Association in Rochford Committee. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at you, Council Mrs. Something. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, question 32. Uh, did you feel that there was a conflict of interest between your role as a portfolio holder and also a member on the Sanctuary Housing <coughs> Association in Rochford Committee? Well, the short answer is no. Uh, the decisions relating to Francis Cotty Lodge were made by the Board of Rochford Housing Association before it transferred its engagements into Sanctuary Housing Association. The structure of RHA, Rochford Housing Association, which used the National Housing Federation's NHF model rules in 2005 version, allowed for the local authority to appoint up to four members of the board. So it was always intended that the board would have council representation. As part of its standard governance practices, board members of RHA were required to declare any interest in any items under discussion. They each made a declaration about their position as a member of the council. None of the board members acted on behalf of the council in negotiating and agreeing content of the legal documents that were signed by the council. This took place at chief executive level. Their role was to act as a board member of RHA in agreeing and signing off the proposals. <coughs> Thank you. Any questions? No. Okay, so moving on to question 33. Um, why are the proceedings of the Watchford Housing Board and its successor effectively exempt? even with no report back to members of the council. Can this be challenged? Thank you, Chairman. I'll start with this, sir. Rochford Housing Association was a separate legal entity from the council and was not covered by the provisions of the Local Government Act 2000, which govern whether information is exempt or publicly available. After RHA transferred its engagements to Sanctuary Housing Association, a new committee was established by SHA to oversee its operations in Rochford. Sanctuary Housing Association is also a separate legal entity from the council and a private body which is not covered by the legislation. We will consider communication from members back to the council further at our next committee meeting. Thank you very much. Any questions? Councillor Mr Hoy. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I may have been at fault in this when I was a member of the board myself, but um, in the constitution it does say that um, reports could be expected back every six months from outside bodies. Um, 
is that what you mean by what you may consider in the future? Thank you. Short answer, yes. Thank you. Any further questions? So, Thank you, Chairman. This is just a clarification, really, uh, mainly um, for the Secretary. Can you tell me, please, do you have any, do you have or need any planning permission to continue with change of views? Sorry, Chairman, I can't hear. Mr. Francis, continue. Question regarding planning permission? Not for change of views, no. You don't need planning permission. Um, if RDC were, were not to use this facility, what would happen to this site? For example, would it be led to other councils? No. Um, the question is, sorry, if you didn't hear, if RDC don't use it, what would be the future use? If they were not to use it for some reason. Are you able to answer that then? Or there's an indication of what? Well, I think it's probably a question that was the council officers want to respond to when we're being discussed during the council. So the wild the previous was aware, so we can move on. Sorry, can't hear you. Yes, I was just saying it might be a question for the council officers to respond to. Because I think what you're saying is, well, we won't be using it for this, but it'll be used for something else. Yes. Well, our intention is to use it to support the needs of the um, district and the land respect of okay, the by council officers. Mm -hmm. do, do, do you have any legal re requirement to supply emergency accommodation? Yes. The secretary, not, not the Russian history. No, we don't have a, a, a statutory but we are firmly committed to support the council and its ability to, to, to progress this country. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mr Mason. Chairman, I thought I got to the bottom of this when I asked my own question and I now have some concern that need for clarification. I understood from Ms Moss that um, there, is, there is or there will be a legal agreement between the council and sanctuary about the usage of Francis Cotting Dodge, which will, which will form the basis of a nomination agreement and terms. Therefore, I assumed that if that didn't happen, we'd be in breach. We be the council. Yes, I, I believe that. That isn't understood. Maybe the, the question wasn't heard. So, um, the question was if RDC didn't use the vicinity, what would happen to him? The, the council would be in breach. If there was a nomination in place, it would be a breach. Any further questions, Councillor Stanton? Just, thank you, Chairman. Just to try to summarise a, a couple of points, the Secretary of Housing will communicate with, with residents um, a little bit, perhaps, uh, in the foreseeable future. Um, I think some of the indications are that uh, residents are concerned with uh, um, basically the, the car parking facilities and, and, and traffic that's going to be generated on that corner. As you know, it's a very busy, busy corner where you've got buses turning in, turning out of there and, and what have you. Um, and to block any part of the road with, with uh, contractors or vehicles of, of that nature would only increase the, the uh, um, aggravation to the, to the site and to the residents locally. So I would imagine that uh, Sanctuary would, would be in uh, contact with, with residents as to, and, and tell them exactly what is going on to, to, uh, to, to get this, all this work to be done in the future so that it doesn't block driveways and, and that sort of thing. As I think that that is another thing that they're, they're concerned about is, is, is their residential area being blocked by, by uh, traffic that, that uh, really is they can't use to get in and out of their properties. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to take that. When uh, planning commission was, uh, was granted on the 19th of January, um, this year there was a discussion um, at the planning committee um, because um, people had spoken about concerns um, about um, the, uh, vehicles parking on, on the highway. Um, so actually there is a condition within planning and, and that's available on, on the planning portal so people can look at the decision notice where it does say that we have to keep the park, material, equipment, site vehicles and um, the site visitors vehicles um, on our site so that can't be parked on the highway. So that is a condition of our plan. Um, in terms of advising residents um, of, pro of progress, so talking not of our own tenants, but the, the wider residents, 
and we will be updating the frequently asked questions on our website in the next couple of weeks because as I said earlier um, work will start fairly imminently so certainly before work uh, some actual work um, begins we will make sure that we write to the immediate neighbours we will update the information on our website and it will clearly state in there um, you know to who to contact if people have any concerns and also setting out in there what I've just said about parking arrangements um, and also um, about working Councillor Mrs. Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to go slightly back on the legal agreement. I must admit, I've had elements of concern which I'm hoping you don't justify. Um, when we had the nomination agreement done, you mentioned that there is a notice period on either side, which is customary under any legal contract, there's usually a right to give notice. But there doesn't seem to be a term on this agreement. If there's no term, even a minimum term, then in theory, if not in practice, um, either side could give the notice <coughs> almost straight away. Um, that would mean that we have gone through um, a difficult exercise, at least, we say, and notice may be given by sanctuary that we want the property back, or vice versa, and sanctuary would also lose the work they put in there, but if there is no minimum term, they're, they're, to my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's a possibility that notice could be given and another provider could then have that accommodation. Now, I know we've asked the question and we've been reassured that RDC have no nomination rights at the moment, but there seems to be no length of time that we will have those nomination rights for, and I would like to ask for some reassurance on that point, if I've made myself clear. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, if I, can we talk about nominations for the moment? And I think if I remember rightly, it's five years. So there is a, there so is a, five minute, years is five is a minimum. Years. Yeah. <coughs> and then there's a right to renew it. Yeah. And, you know, so there'll be a renewal term. But as we well, said, it wasn't clear when you were talking about it earlier, thank you, that, that is reassuring. Thank you. Um, that concludes all the questions that were put in advance to everybody. Um, nobody's indicated they've got any further questions. And it has presently finished at on 9 o'clock. So, um, firstly, we need to ask members um, whether or not they would like to consider coming back after perhaps a five minute break in the moment to allow other people to leave the chamber to start debating um, on what we've heard this evening or whether or not members feel that they would prefer to debate it at a separate later meeting. Have anybody got any comments or views? Councillor Mr Mason first. Chairman, I think there's something in excess of 30 all questions yes. and numerous supplements which obviously I participated in. Uh, I've, I've got a bit of brain freeze at the moment. Um, like we did with the Michelin Farm situation, we benefited from seeing the questions, seeing the answers and coming to, a, to another meeting. It gives us also the opportunity to really focus on what things we want to actually form part of a recommendation. At the moment, I haven't got a clue. If I may say, I'm so being open and honest, it's a transparent thing. Um, I prefer to have a bit of time looking at the, at the answers, to the answers to formulate my own thoughts. And then defer the meeting. Councillor Shaw. Well, I was going to go against that. I was going to say, let's, could we just start debating it and see how the feeling goes with this? Because it's a, quite a very important issue we're dealing with here. And as we've had the answers here tonight with the questions, they're going to be fresh and we could start debating it tonight. Councillor Cooper. I uh, agree with John Mason. I think we should come back and uh, uh, discuss it again. Uh, where everybody's got a clear head and we can take in the answers that we've been given and uh, have a clear, clear uh, head when we come back. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Hoy. Thank you, Chairman. I do agree that I think we would serve residents better if we came back on another day. 
we think clear in our mind what we're trying to achieve. I think at the moment we first got to ask us lots of questions, um, and we need to look at them and actually decide what to do. I think we don't have time to do that now and to do this matter justice. But we can come back fairly soon. I imagine we can come back either next week at a special meeting or on the 13th. <coughs> the next of review. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I do concur, but for a more practical reason, you, you will think that normally we have a recommendation in front of us, and it can take us a long time on committee to agree that and reword it. At the moment, we've got nothing, no outline. I think that we could spend all evening going around that, whereas with the time back to Perhaps we can have some suggestions put forward and that would be more focused okay. and clear. So yeah. again, I agree with the previous councillors. Thank you, Councillor Simon. Thank you, Chairman. Um, with, the, with, with the answers that we've had tonight from, from the panel uh, to the committee, um, we can deliberate those answers at another meeting um, to, to evaluate what the where we are in, in this case. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <coughs> um, I think obviously there is a, a, a divided opinion on whether we come back to it immediately after. Can we point to a vote then? Let's see what the divided yeah. opinion is. So so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had to take a vote on it, members obviously of the review committee and um, those in favour of coming back and debating this evening, if you could raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. Is that just five? No. Oh. And five. five. Members of the committee that would like to discuss and debate this at a later date, which ought to be arranged. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven. Okay, and that's seven, so that's carried that the review committee will discuss and debate this evening's sponsors at a later meeting. Can I just ask how soon that meeting will take place? My simple business concern is those poor people sitting in bed and breakfast are still waiting for We are just debating it over the and we're so that it will be one of the what we will aim for it to be discussed at the 13th of June meeting. Um, we are going to struggle to do it before that in the general election. Councillor, this is just, just a point of clarity, Chairman. I don't believe the building's available. So we're not holding anyone no. up anywhere. No, it's not available. So if we hold this meeting next week, the week after, it's not going to, it's not going to cause a problem for anybody who needs accommodation. Any further comments? If not, no, if not, then we will close the meeting at six minutes past nine. Thank you to everybody who attended this evening.